Our human activities consume resources and produce waste, and nature needs to have the capacity to meet these demands. The ecological footprint is a way to measure our human demand on nature. Every one of us has an ecological footprint. The footprint represents the impact of a person, a household, a city, a business, or a country on nature. Things like food, energy, transportation, goods and services all contribute to our ecological footprint. The footprint is expressed as the amount of land and water required to produce what we consume and to absorb the waste we generate. By measuring the ecological footprint, we can assess the pressure our lifestyle puts on the planet. This helps us to manage our ecological assets more wisely and to take personal and collective action. Good day. Welcome to Global Sustainable TV program. My name is Gökhan Yildirim. I'm the president of the World Sustainable Energy Institute and we organize in Chevre TV Global Sustainability program. We talk, we discuss, we learn from each other and we inform developing countries. We share the experience of developed countries on environment and sustainable issues. Great pleasure to have as a guest, Mr. Dr. Matis Wackernagel on our program. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce Mr. Matis Wackernagel. Hello, Matis. How are you? I go, it's such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. That was a beautiful opening. I was really like this movie was cool. I haven't seen it. Yes, this was our surprise to you. Not just the baklava and the lahmacun, Thank you. but the video is, has to be good. <laughs> <laughs> So, Excellent. dear Matis, in our audience are very excited to know about you and also the story of the ecological footprint. Mm -hmm. But beside that, while I was studying at Technical University of Vienna on traffic planning, my thesis was compression of two cities uh, using your method, ecological footprint. And it was very interesting. Uh, um, the method using on traffic planning was not easy, but very fascinating. Thanks again for your uh, method. But uh, therefore, this. I'm, I'm sorry, I hope it wasn't too much suffering. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the day using data and finding the right stuff was not easy, yeah, but yeah. I did it. I got 100% uh, from Professor Knopflacher, so it was a very nice tool for me. Awesome. He really delighted that. Thanks again for your method, it really helped me. Mm -hmm. And also, this interview has a great, huge meaning because of uh, the thesis that I worked in Vienna Technical University. And as far as um, ecological footprint, we will talk today about human activities, resources and waste, also reducing carbon footprint. But before that, uh, first, who is Matthias Wackernagel? Could you tell us? about yourself yeah please. I ask myself every day in some ways but I grew up in Switzerland and and, and a big story I, I'm, I'm born in 1962 so not so much after World War II my parents and my grandparents lived to World War II Switzerland was very lucky not to be in the war itself but I didn't have enough food it only had seven months of food per year so food was rationed it was very tight and the relationship between resources and and our well-being was very obvious to my grandparents my parents that was a story that carried in my life. I also, I, I also spend many days on a farm as my vacation, and just seeing where food comes from and how we live from that, and how the the countryside feeds the city, and the city doesn't give that much back. That was fascinating to me. What was even more striking was in 1973. I was 11 years old. Obviously, we had the oil crisis, and the Swiss reaction to the oil crisis was to have three car free Sunday, car free Sundays. And that was so exciting for me as a kid because with the bicycle we could go on the highway and bicycle around and it was the air was pure it was great and so i thought wow we will have to live without fossil fuel and that will be wonderful uh, my perhaps my parents were more nervous than me but i had a great time and so that was also a vision that that i carried for my life that that led to kind of becoming an engineer and thinking how can we start to live 
without using fossil fuels, with windmills and solar power, etc. And then further on realizing we need to go even further. We need to understand society much more deeply. And that's when I got into planning and when, when with Bill Rees, uh, I developed the ecological footprint in, in Canada. That was just around the time when there was this global conversation about sustainable development, you know, when the Brompton report came out, the Rio conference in 1992, and everybody talked about sustainability, but there was no measure. Even though it's so obvious, in the end, there's one planet. And the question is, how do we fit on this one planet? How many planet would it take if everybody lives like me? For example, it's a measurable question. And uh, that's what we pursued. That's, that's the idea of the economy. No, it's interesting also. When I was using your method in my thesis, I recognized that the comparison or using this method, you use the temperature. If you are 40, it says that you are <laughs> ill. So it was a nice uh, explanation of that. And, but let's get forward and a bunch of questions about mm. ecological footprints. Mm -hmm. um, for example, what is ecological footprint? And how can we mm -hmm. reduce? How can we calculate? Yeah. Yeah. And difficulties of calculations. Yeah. First, these three bunch of questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, very, very easy questions. <laughs> very easy questions in some ways, because in some ways, what's most limiting to us is the ability of the Earth to renew. The biggest farm we have is the planet, or every country in the end is a farm. You know, And so the question is, how much is being regenerated compared to how much it takes for us to live, for our food, for our fiber, for, our, for absorbing our waste, for uh, hosting our roads and and houses so we can calculate that very easy we call it it's like basic bookkeeping it's bean counting you know we count all the cheese how much air does it is needed to produce that cheese and for the coffee etc so it's so the principles are very simple once we then apply it to comparing nations obviously we use un data sets we use about 15000 data points per country and year so it gets more complicated and detailed but the principle how much do you use how much do you have? Now, how is it possible that we can actually use more than what we have? It's the same like with money. Some people spend more than they earn. You know, In the same way, we spend more ecological resources than the, our plant is able to renew. And uh, we can do that for some time, but not forever. But, that's, um, that's the issue. Yes, uh, but there's a conflict, right? So changing the culture, the people are lazy. So and they don't want to change their culture. So it has to be attractive yeah. in a way. Uh, exactly, therefore, it has to be attractive. And, um, and, and, and exactly for that reason, we don't say reduce your footprint. Actually, in the beginning we did, it was a big mistake. I, I went to Chile and there was a brilliant student at the end who had these buttons that say, reduce your footprint. And this student at the end, she said, why should I reduce my footprint so that yes. you can eat more chocolate? You know, so, so what's in it for me? And, and I think that's why I, I reframe it. Actually, I, when people ask me, how do you reduce your footprint? I say, I don't reduce my footprint. I increase my resource security. That's the question. I think yes, for every true. country, the question is, are you resource secure? Given like, for example, Switzerland, where I'm from, it takes four Switzerlands to support Switzerland. UK similar, it takes four UKs to support the UK. How, like from a strategic perspective, how can that not be a risk? In a, in, a, in a situation where the world is using more and more and the competition for resources is getting stronger. So resource security is vastly underestimated as a key strategic asset for a country. And so any competitiveness plan of a country, any economic development plan that doesn't have resource security at its core is really incredibly misguided. It's useless. And, and, and unfortunately, most of our competitors and, and economic development plans ignore the resource situation and I think at their peril. Because the, the, the situation is really this. It's a very simple thing. We've never understood the future better. We can predict the future more clearly now than ever in human history. We know exactly that people will want to eat and sleep and be safe. And we also know that whatever trajectory we take, there will be more climate change and more resource constraints. If we act fast, obviously, there will, be, there will be not as much more climate change, but there still will be more climate change. And given that, the question is, if you don't prepare yourself for that future, you, you will be at peril. It's not just about the world. The world is the context. But given that world, if 
Istanbul does not prepare itself for the future we can anticipate, it's going to be Istanbul that will have a lot of difficulties. Yes, I agree. But um, um, while you, when you were explaining the stuff, uh, it was fascinating to hear that um, if everybody knows what is a resource and what's a region and in, in which region, which resources are available. So, for example, there is no banana in Istanbul or in Vienna. So we don't need to get a banana from Colombia or Costa Rica. So, but... Uh, there are some big issues. The mothers and fathers, they said, okay, uh, one banana for a day is a healthy thing. So this mm. is actually the politicians' issue, I suppose. It because um, we are we're all decision politics. makers, I would say. We are all decision makers. Some of them bigger ones, some of them smaller. You know, if we if we uh, every euro we spend, for example, or dollar or um, What's the currency again in Turkey? I forgot. Lira, it's Turkish lira, foreign. yes. Lira, li lira Turkish yes. lira, yeah, lira, Turkish yes. lira. Every lira you spend is a decision. It's, a, it's an investment. It's an investment in your future. What kind of a future are you buying yourself by spending your money? And if we don't direct it towards making ourselves more resource secure, it's actually an investment against ourselves. It's a bet against ourselves. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> the other bunch of questions, I have lots of questions for you today. Please do. Um, so the base of sustainability is ecological footprint we talked about. Mm -hmm. And for example, um, I mean, it was a good um, explanation. Reducing is not attractive. So, but uh, how could we reduce our ecological footprint? Absolutely. So what we do, so, so the, many, the many ways how we can make ourselves more resource secure, so it's out to our benefit. One thing we do just to kind of make, I think what the origin is, is a concept that is actually the driver of everything that's, that's, that's kind of threatening us. And yet there may not be a good word in most languages. In English, it's called overshoot and very few people have heard of it. Overshoot means again that we can use more than what Earth renews. And not only that we actually can, we actually do. We calculate that so we can compare how much does humanity use compared to what Earth can renew. And currently we use about 73% more than what Earth can renew. And then we should oh. also remember that if we use the entire planet, there wouldn't be much space for lions and, and elephants and, <laughs> and, and wild species in general. So, so maybe we want to use far less than the entire planet. But we already use 73% more than the planet. So you can translate that and say from January 1st to 29th of July this year, humanity has used as much as Earth can renew in the entire year. And there are 155 days missing from July 29th till the end of the year. 155 days. Why? Wow, that's a that's a long time. True. So so th this this kind of is a way to translate that even primary school students can understand. They say, okay, uh, you know, July 29th is still a long way. So they understand overshoot and they stand kind of in in quantitative terms where we are at. And that's why we launched a new thing this year. We call it 100 Days of Possibility because there are 100 days between Earth Overshoot Day and the big climate conference that's going to come to overwhelm people with possibilities because there's so many things that we could do. Not just that we could do, but that actually are economically viable. That's kind of the key thing. It's actually making us economically stronger. What can we do? It's very simple. We say, move the date. How do we move the date? We put the hand forward because it has five fingers. The thumb is we can make the planet healthier and stronger by conservation or, or regenerative agriculture, all these kind of things that actually make sure our ecosystems can be healthy. And then on the demand side, there are four big things. They're slightly overlapping, but they're basically these four things. How do we organize our cities? That determines like, is our house efficient? long transportation patterns, how, like how, how do we shop, etc. So how are our cities organized? Because the ways our cities are built have a huge impact on how you live. If you live, for example, in Atlanta and the United States, very, you need a car just to get a bit of milk, you know? And if you, if you are in a Mediterranean city, you can walk around, you live in a more compact situation. It's, it's much more resource efficient. Then the second one is how do we power ourselves? Do we power ourselves with coal power, for example, very inefficient, or with solar and wind, for example? 
then how do we feed ourselves? About half of the biocapacity on the planet already is occupied by food. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big issue. And obviously, there's a lot we can do around that as well. Do we, like how, how many animal products are part of our diet? How much food waste is there, et cetera? And then the last one is how many we are. That's a very slow factor, but it's a cumulative factor. So if we had reproductive rates, for example, like in Portugal and Italy, around the world, we would be more like four and a half billion people by the end of the century. Uh, currently, the trajectory points towards 10 to 11 billion people. So that makes a, a big difference because if you have double as many people, there's only half as much biocapacity per person on the planet, obviously. That's a mathematical thing. So all these things have huge opportunities to improve people's quality of life. Um, and so these are just kind of the arenas. And if you go to 100daysofpossibility.org, our website, uh, it's like, like every day we put up something new and say, oh my God, so many possibilities. Yes, um, and mm, <laughs> in which fields, where can we use this method, uh, Matis? Um, we can make the conversation short if you ask me where not to use it. Sorry? <laughs> we can make the conversation short by saying where can we not use it. Just yes. meaning that actually, I mean, it applies, to, <laughs> it applies to anywhere. It can be like, obviously, we, we have these national calculations because we think in the end for a nation... That no, it's a nice... It's the the, cal the, cal the you, ecological how, footprint calculator yeah. is, a, is mm. super. It's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. You can do it for, your, for an individual. But I think if, if you like traveling around and you can't get around that easily because of COVID and all kinds of other things, go to data.footprintnetwork.org and then you see for every nation around the world, you can click on them, you can see the trajectory. How much do they have per person? How much do they use per person? You can then scroll into more details. Uh, but um, yeah, do that as a, as a, as a trip. Um, and then you will see, for example, that the UK uses four times more than what they have available. And they want to be independent. I don't know exactly yeah. how that works. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe next time we have to bring an Eng English man and to ask <laughs> how is your ecological yeah, yeah. footprint. And yeah, yeah. this will be interesting. So let's come to the smart cities. <laughs> what do you think about smart cities, Matthew? I mean, smart is always better than dumb, you know. <laughs> so what? What? What a smart? What, but for me, for me, <laughs> is, uh, is, uh, I don't like smart people. I like dumb people because it's easy. It's, so you can talk easily. You don't have to be smart. I mean, then you require lots of energy. A dump is easy. A dump is beautiful, yeah. actually. It is simple. Uh, that means, that's, it I've is... never thought of that. It's, it's, it's a good point. Yeah, and, and in, in some ways, I mean, I think what smart cities really refers to is to say, I mean, we have a lot of hardware infrastructure, and then by using that infrastructure in better ways, by organizing it better, by using information technology, by organizing it better, we can make them far, far more efficient. As we just said before, cities are a huge node that determine to a large extent how we live and how they're organized, if they're well organized. That's how we live. We think we are educated by our parents, but we are much more educated by our cities. The cities determine how far we go, where we go, how, how much energy it takes to, to, to keep our houses comfortable, etc. So, so urban design, and, and I'm, I'm a regional planner, you did regional planning. In, in some ways, that's really where we design the future. That's I want to I explain, so to explain a, a story. I was in uh, Shanghai, which is a smart city mm -hmm. as well. And it was mm -hmm. interesting, starting from the airport to the center, everything is smart, uh, Chinese, English, and metros, it works. And some parts is not smart, it's all Chinese. So you feel <laughs> something that the railway goes, and suddenly there is no railway, and you are uh, like uh, in the uh, desert, and you, you have no idea what mm -hmm. to do. So for me, it is to be a smart requires quality, requires high quality of people and high quality of infrastructure. So being a smart is a very big issue, like zero waste. If you say that I want a zero waste, you need to educate the people, you need to educate the uh, children and you have to uh, build up nice policies. But if you don't invest to the people, if you don't invest to the infrastructure, and how could you talk about smart cities? How could you talk about zero waste? So it is. It's, it's I mean, it, 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 I I love what you say, and I remember like I don't go to airports as much anymore because of COVID, and I try not to get a fly on necessarily as much as well in some ways because it's very resource intensive. But going to airports where they're like the most wealthy people probably, the most privileged people go through, and then they have these beautiful. Um, 
waste systems. They say, okay, here's recycling, here is compost, here's something else. And then I look into the garbage can and say, oh my God, people can't even distinguish what's compost compostable, <laughs> what's recyclable. Like even well-educated, wealthy people don't understand materials and what's biology and what's metal. <laughs> so, my goodness. That's so, 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 so. It's we, not a, it's I not think an Our easy relationship issue. with nature is, is still is quite broken, still, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, the, the nature doesn't love <laughs> us. <laughs> so, uh, let's, let's come to the. I climate. think nature loves us, but the question is do we love nature? <laughs> I mean, actually, we don't know what nature is because we don't know who we are. So, this is the first question yeah, yeah, what is a human true. being? We are nature. And, yes, we are, we are nature. nature. We belong to them, but mm. how do you have to veer? How do you have to eat? and produce so mm -hmm. it is it's a big task to talk so that, that's sometimes i'm saying with pride you know who am i i'm really a bag of ocean water walking on land because with the way life evolved we evolved in oceans and then some entities were able to pack up this ocean and take it on the land and then it just continued to evolve evolve that's why we we have salinity in our blood as, as, a, as a memory of, of our early evolution and 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 so we are so much nature we are so so i, I mean, perhaps with covid we realized how much nature we are how much yes. biology we are that yes. we are actually one biology and we, we heard of the butterfly effect you know like we had heard the butterfly effect like how some small things can have an effect somewhere else but actually we, we, i calculated with some friends what's the weight of all the covid viruses and it turned out all the covid viruses are weighing less than one butterfly wing <coughs> true and look at the impact and we, so we are, we are we are very connected biologically and recognizing that is actually something beautiful because we see wow if we destroy our host ecosystems and we are part of these ecosystems that must hurt us and it does yes so actually as a human being we have to know uh, our abilities and our resources as well and we have to respect but if um, this know-how has to be taught for example i've been living in a city i don't know if the what's the air quality and also the question of a mayor maybe has to be like uh, what could you in fact invest for uh, less traffic two two days ago we had to arrange this uh, video but it wasn't mm. easy to reach the uh, studio so <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting Thanks again for uh, postponing the event uh, and also the water quality of the tamp mm. water uh, is it drinkable or not and what's the price as a mayor to invest for this infrastructure for a healthy city so mm. I don't need too much digitals and smarts, la la la, lily cities. A city can be dumb. A city can be easy, mm. not too difficult, uh, reachable, accessible, and understandable as well. So you mm. don't need to be a smart person to get <laughs> from A to B. It has to be very easy by foot, uh, with, by bicycle, also using the transportations mm -hmm. as well. The sustainable options have to be easier and more pleasant, and that's kind of, kind of done. And, and and your professor Knopflacher was very adamant about that, and I think that's that's exactly right. You know, and that's why people love to come to Istanbul to walk in the beautiful old city because actually the experience of being able to walk around and have this sense of kind of community is what people crave for. So actually, the sustainable options are also the much more pleasant one. If uh, he says that if a city is not walkable, it's not a city, it's not yours. So, and mm. the city for cars or the city for the people? So, this is the questions exactly. that we have learned for the first. And what do you think about climate change, Mathis? I mean, we talked about overshoot. Climate change is, just, is a symptom of this larger issue that our demand for nature has become so large that it doesn't cope. And so, it builds an ecological debt. One ecological debt is the CO2 accumulation in the atmosphere and bring, bringing climate change about. And the, and, and the point really is the future will, will, the future will be regenerative. There's no question. The question is only how we get there. Do we get there by design or by disaster? And climate change is one of the, of, of the reminders that's going to, it's going to happen if we don't act on it. We will have to live without fossil fuels, no matter whether we like it or not. 
But if we delay that, then we even destroy more of the biocapacity, the ability of the Earth to regenerate, and we have even less budget left. So, so we have choice. We call it sometimes one planet prosperity. Do we want one planet prosperity or do we want the other alternative, which is one planet misery? It's a very difficult decision. Do you want one planet prosperity or do you want one planet misery? Oh, think a lot about it. Oh, I guess I want one planet prosperity. Then, <laughs> then choose design, not disaster. You know, it's pretty easy. Yes. And um, <laughs> before inviting to, to our Global Sustainability Program, we have the um, communications with the Chevrolet TV uh, managers. They said that we are very happy to invite you as the carbon footprint. I said it's not carbon mm -hmm. footprint, it's ecological footprint. And uh, could carbon you explain Carbon is a big us? part. Yeah, yes. carbon is a big part. So, so, so when we started with the ecological footprint, we said, okay, how big is the earth? Um, how much do we use? And one of the uses, one of the competing use, is obviously we eat carrots, and we, one competing use is that we need capacity to absorb the CO2 from, from fossil fuel. Back then they said, oh, nobody cares. Nobody sees CO2. And suddenly the pendulum is on the other side, which is, it's only carbon. Yeah, carbon is a big, big thing. But if we move out of carbon by just pushing the pressure on somewhere else, by, by using more wood as energy or, or, or by paving Fossil over foils. places for, for photovoltaics or whatever. So, so, so if we just displace the problem, we're not going to win. We really have to look at the whole system and say, how, like, fossil fuels coming to an end, how can we move out of fossil fuels without ruining the rest of the planet. So looking at it as a whole is actually not more complicated. It makes solutions more effective and more, more efficient. And that's why I think looking at the world from the perspective of, of, of uh, resource security is really helpful. If we just say climate change, I think, there's the danger that people think there's what, what some call the tragedy of the commons. They say, oh, it's just about the world. How much do I have to give up to help the world? And what do I get back? Oh, not so much, therefore let not act, let's not act. And I think that's the wrong framework. If you actually see climate change in the context of resource constraints as a whole, you start to realize that if you are not ready, if your city is not able to live well in a world of resource constraints and climate change, it's going to be your city that suffers. And that shifts the idea of saying, oh, actually, waiting for action is the dumbest thing I could do. And that's what we're doing now. We have these climate negotiations and wait and say, oh, once the nations agree, then we we'll start acting. Actually, if the world is not coming to an agreement or not coming to a strong enough agreement, your need to act gets even stronger because the world will become even wilder. So it's exactly the opposite of what we hear typically in the conversation. Like this Par Paris Agreement, Turkey decided today to sign the Paris Agreement lately but the US and the China has to do the same as well. <laughs> Let's they see. have actually, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I think China actually understands it even better because China Yeah, they understand, they but they are the, the more world. polluters, they right? They do it for themselves. Yeah, yes, they understand. And they also, and they drive also a lot of green technology, I mean, in terms of uh, photovoltaics, but yeah, is it fast enough that we can debate? I don't think so. And, so not, let's, and at their own peril. Mm -hmm. So let's come to the waste. Uh, what do you think about yeah. waste, the energy, and zero waste? Waste is bad. <laughs> <laughs> but we produce all waste, right? Particularly so. the waste, bring my waste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My waste line. No, but I mean, that's kind of the whole point that actually nature doesn't distinguish so much between resources and waste you know so the waste becomes resources for the next thing like the fungi they use the they, they use the decayed plants kind of to, to make them into soil and the soil becomes soil again for plants etc so if we can move things in cycles and, and, and maintain the nutrients that's a much more clever way than just to kind of take from somewhere operate and, and th throw it out so so our wasteful way of operating it's going to hurt us eventually, but there are other ways as well. You know? So there are other ways as well. That's why I think if we think of waste, the most important thing first would be to separate out what's compostable because the compostable part goes back to life, to biology. And also it helps people to recognize, oh, wow, this is biology. This is something living. I'm contributing to it. So even mentally, I think being able to separate waste into saying this is biological that can be composted and this is things that can be reused. And then these are things that cannot be reduced. That, <laughs> that's actually 
even spiritually help, helpful, I think. But, uh, do but you, yeah. ab about zero waste, do you think is zero waste is possible or is it a good philosophy? What are your opinions? I mean, according to me, waste, we have to reduce the waste, but zero waste. For example, I am 130 I mean, kilos. Is, yeah. I can't be <laughs> 60 in Hocus Pocus. It's not possible. So what yeah, do you think yeah, about yeah, zero waste? A, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's great to have aspirations. I think it's kind of taking one thing out. I think eventually the bigger question is do we fit on the planet, you know? So, 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 yeah, so if we, are, if we yes. now categorize as many things as waste. So actually, waste that becomes part of compost not just again and fit, becomes soil if, again uh, yes. is different. Yes, not just we, if we fit to the world, if our waste fit to the world as well. Then the question yeah. is, would be nice if we have a zero waste, but it's not possible, right? And what kind of waste? I remember as a child, as I said, I was in this farm. We were spreading the manure from the cows on the field. And actually, the, the fields, they, they, they are very happy because they have more nutrients to grow well. So, 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 so waste streams that are really part so of the cycle cycles. that it's operate. Life cycles then it's a life cycle. It's like the circular economy idea. Then that's, that's wonderful. If waste accumulates and becomes toxic and, and doesn't, doesn't become an input to something else, then it's absolutely wrong and that, that, that we need to avoid. So producing waste that, that leads long-term problems of pollution and contamination is horrible. So uh, let's come to the politics. Uh, what do you think about the <clears throat> renewable energy policies of, of the states and the China? I mean, let's, let's first the question meet USA. What do you think about the renewable energy policy of United States? I mean, there's so many stories to tell about that. <laughs> On the one hand, it's inspiring to see... The short one and the that, fascinated one. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the wonderful thing is that even some kind of very conservative investors have started to recognize the, the economic advantage and the significance and the need of renewables. The, 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 the sad story is we are moving far, far too slowly. Uh, the sad part is that we are moving still from, from oil into gas. I don't think gas is a great transition strategy. We should move directly into renewables. And I think that's not yet mainstream. Yes. Um, and last word, Matis. And, and it's uh, possible. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> no, no. Last words. Uh, what do you want to advise to our guests and also for Chevre TV, uh, environmental television on Turkish television? What... Uh, Say something good for us, so we could be happy. <laughs> we're, we're often asked, yeah, what should, what's the one thing that we should do? And of course, there's never kind of one thing, but what we often say to say, sleep enough, because it's all about good decisions. If you don't sleep enough, your brain is not fresh and you don't make good decisions, because sustainability and good decisions are totally aligned. In the end, actually, preparing yourself for the future that is predictable is the best thing you can do, and it's the best thing you can do for the world. It's like with COVID, you know, protecting yourself protects the others. So actually preparing Istanbul for the future that is, going to, that is inevitably going to come is absolutely necessary for Istanbul and it's also great for the world. Thank you, uh, Matis, uh, for joining to our program. I will close uh, the interview it's been today. It's a pleasure. <laughs> hope, to take, hope to see you again. Thank you so much for having me and uh, yeah. Great that you're doing this. Congratulations. Awesome. Uh, thanks for watching us. And we will invite every week different guests from all over the world. Stay with us.